Ladies and gentlemen, welcome wrestling fans worldwide to Knoxville and the Great Smoky Mountains for the Ron Fuller Tennessee Studcast. Six feet nine inches tall, 265 pounds. This historic podcast from one of the most respected and successful wrestlers and promoters will follow the footsteps of the largest and oldest wrestling family on the planet. Listen to what I'm saying. That's right. Bring that camera in here a little bit closer. Through 93 years and four Four generations. The stud has arrived. Old school or new fan, this unique broadcast will educate and captivate as Ron details decades of professional wrestling's growth with truly unforgettable stories. I want those people out there at home to hear the stud. Sit back and enjoy the ride with the Tennessee stud. The Tennessee stud. You will learn that name, you will remember it. And now, the stud is here. Hey everybody, welcome in once again. It's David Summers hosting another stud cast with the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller. This is the story of wrestling in America, as told by the stud, whose family started the profession over 100 years ago. So now, let's step back into the ring, back into time, as we get wall to wall and tree top tall with the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller. Hey, Ron, let's start off by saying welcome back. A lot of folks missed the stud cast last week. You were out on the road making an appearance here in Southeast Alabama. You could not do the normal stud cast. So how did that trip go for you? Oh man, it went great, Dave. I had a great time. I got to see hundreds, literally hundreds of fans in that area. Uh, that Southeastern area was on fire 44 years ago, back in 1980 where we're going to be focusing on later in this uh, stud cast. And uh, those that were able to watch back then, they have not forgotten, I can tell you that, what wrestling was like in those days and how totally different it was than what's being offered today. All right? I guess I heard that uh, about a hundred times, you know, <laughs> about uh, what happened to the old wrestling. And so uh, it's, uh, it's, it's sport has changed, that's for sure. Well, that's, to me, that's what makes your studcast unique. Each one is a historical journey back in time, taking a look at what you and your wrestling companies were doing then that was making history. With your new hidden history lessons of wrestling in each episode now, we're riding back almost 100 years to 1930 in your grandfather Roy's time. We're going to do that today. So he was about to start doing then what you were doing in 1980, and that is lighting up wrestling, no doubt. Yeah, well, you know, that's it. That's exactly where we're going to begin this one, Dave, in 1930, man, way, way back there. And with another hidden history lesson, except the major difference between what was happening in wrestling in Southeastern time and what my grandfather was dealing with in 1930 was the Great Depression. And in 1980, the country had just elected Ronald Reagan uh, president. And back in the, the day uh, when uh, we were cranking things uh, big time down there in the southeastern Gulf Coast, Ronald Reagan had just been elected president of the country. And, uh, and uh, he was following a horrible four-year recession in the country at that point where everybody was experiencing inflation. And uh, it's a problem basically was we're currently dealing with today in 2024. So Ronald Reagan was going to light up the country and make the 1980s some of the best years in American history. I think the best decade ever for wrestling. So, uh, but let's, let's go back 50 years to 1930 where America was headed into maybe its worst years ever at the time uh, when my grandfather was leaving the Ohio wrestling territory where he'd been for six years. And uh, he'd already made a name for himself. Uh, he'd learned how to not only wrestle, but to promote, uh, how to book, how to run his own territory. And uh, when he figured all that out, after being there for six years, uh, he rode out of Ohio uh, and, uh, and he went to build his own first territory. So, and he didn't go alone, however, you know. He had impressed some of the great shooters of that time, uh, young wrestlers like he was, that was in the territory with him. Uh, they had seen the, how, how fast he had picked things up. Uh, they knew that he had been uh, working in that office there, and he was ready 
to make a move and maybe on, run his own company. So they were willing to follow him on his journey to build. Over the next 18 years, he was going to build the biggest territory in the history of the South. And he was going to wrestle his way, uh, you know, through the depression of the 1930s, which is what a wrestling struggle that was for everybody. <laughs> and then through the Second World War to become one of the founding fathers of the NWA, the National Wrestling Alliance, in 1948. So by my time, in 1980, the NWA was the oldest and largest wrestling alliance of worldwide promoters and owners anywhere that had ever existed. Nothing ever, ever existed that was like the National Wrestling Alliance. That said a lot about your grandfather and his accomplishments. I would love to know who were the young wrestlers that followed him to Tennessee to build this huge wrestling territory? Well, there were three of them, Dave, and uh, all of them, including Roy, were within seven years of being the same age. So they weren't separated by many years, all young guys. Each of them would become major players in what was going to happen in Tennessee. So let's start with the oldest one. Uh, his real name was Pat O'Brien, but he was better known as Pat Malone. Pat Malone was from Montreal, Canada, and uh, he was two years older than Roy was. Malone had already won multiple world championships, and he was trained by that same guy that we seem to come in back to a lot now, Dave. Uh, he was trained by Farmer Burns, who had trained hundreds of great wrestlers after ending his own ring career. So Pat Malone stayed with Roy in Tennessee his entire ring career, and he worked in Roy's office afterward until he died which was 48 years after he after they arrived in Tennessee. Uh, had a long life, and, uh, and Roy took care of him to the very end. William Sidney Neighbors was the next wrestler. He was known as Danny Ducey. He was four years younger than Roy, and uh, sometimes he, he called himself the Cowboy, Cowboy Danny Ducey. But he was not related in any way to the four famous Ducey brothers, which were one of the most famous a group of brothers that ever wrestled. And so he also stayed with Roy his entire wrestling career, like Pat Malone had, and he worked for the company until he died, which was 52 years after arriving in Tennessee. Now, the third one of these guys, the youngest of the three, was a very special man to me and my family in particular. Uh, his name was Charlie Carr. He was born in 1909. He was from Shreveport, Louisiana. He was the last of the three to come to the Ohio Territory to begin his wrestling career, basically. And once he got there, he was trained a lot by Roy and by Farmer Burns student, Pat Malone. And uh, Charlie wrestled for 30 years for Roy, uh, uh, during which time he trained some of the greatest wrestlers ever born, including the world junior heavyweight champion, Joe McCarthy, uh, Sputnik Monroe was another guy he trained, and hundreds of others. Uh, Charlie Carr became, became a tremendous trainer. And he also trained three generations of my Welsh family. Uh, he trained everybody in the family from Herb to Jack to Lester, who were Roy's three brothers in the first generation. Uh, he trained my father <laughs> and the three Fields brothers. Oh, <laughs> uh, that was uh, they were the sons of Roy's sister. Uh, so he trained that second generation. Uh, and then uh, he trained Robert and I in the third generation of Welch's. Wow. wow. So after all that training for Roy, he wrestled in my father's companies in, in Gulf Coast down there along that territory that uh, we're going to be talking about later. He went with dad to the Arizona territory that dad had. And then he followed Dad to Georgia and Atlanta in uh, 1960, uh, 1964. So, uh, you know, so in Georgia in the 1960s, that's where he basically trained Rob and I while living with us and uh, being supported by my dad. So those three wrestlers combined with Roy, they made actually an unbeatable team. Uh, together, they even survived the 10-year Great Depression. You know, and that depression, that beat almost everybody else in the country. I can tell you that. Wow. So a really remarkable story of loyalty between those four wrestlers. If there was 
if there was only four of them in the beginning of forming this territory, how did they manage to wrestle all around the South with only the same four men on the card time after time? How did that work out? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question, Dave. I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> they they weren't covering all these states of, at the very beginning. I mean, that territory grew over a period of 30 years. But uh, obviously, Roy's two brothers, Herb and Jack, uh, were, were they're both younger than he was, but uh, they were fairly close to Roy's age. They were the first ones that uh, Charlie trained, uh, and uh, they learned for fairly quickly how to wrestle. And uh, they started wrestling pretty soon themselves. Then uh, Charlie was training others that had been that had been, you know that uh, that were coming along after those guys did. So. Roy had basically, he had an answer for almost everything. Uh, even even your question here about how did these three guys make that happen by themselves along with Roy. So the other three wrestlers that came with him, they all had a second identity. And uh, Pat Malone would put on a mask and he became a heel called the Green Shadow. Nobody knew that he was Pat Malone <laughs> when he had the mask on. Uh, you know, uh, Danny Dusick became a wrestler called the Dark Angel, and Charlie Carr became the Black Bat and the Black Menace. <laughs> That's a unique idea. I didn't have any idea that wrestlers were wearing masks that far back. I should have thought of that. But speaking of that, do you have any idea, Ron, when the first mask was worn by a wrestler? Yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, I do, Dave. I do a little research on a whole lot of things, man. And the first mass wrestler debuted in 1865 wow. at the World's Fair in Paris. And his name was Theobald Bauer. <laughs> and uh, he called himself, uh, what else, man, you know, uh, but the mass wrestler. Theobald. Theobald Bauer. Okay, interesting name. All right, <laughs> what don't you know, stud? So with Roy's two brothers added and the three original Ohio wrestlers occasionally wearing masks, did that mean the original four Ohio wrestlers could easily become nine? <laughs> that's very good. I mean, that's a, you, you added that up pretty quickly. Huh? But you're actually off by one. There's one more there. Right, okay. Uh, and, and that was Roy. Okay. <laughs> and he would wear occasionally a mask and call himself the Canadian Wildcat, <laughs> which was the same name that they had given to him when he went to Ohio to wrestle. Right. So he just took that name to Tennessee with it. So uh, so we're in kind of a game of numbers here. So uh, here's a fact that I think is going to shock you a little bit, Dave. By the late 1950s, in that Tennessee territory, uh, there were going to be well over a hundred wrestlers. And as far as I know, in those days and, uh, and pretty much at any time ever, the Tennessee territory was quite possibly the biggest wrestling territory in the world. Okay. Over a hundred wrestlers in one territory. That doesn't sound possible. All right. I got another question back to the depression years when Roy was just starting. A lot of people in America were starving. I mean, Hungry, standing in food lines. How much did wrestlers get paid in those days? What was it like? Well, you're just full of good questions, Dave. Man. So, <laughs> so uh, I asked my grandfather that question once, man. You know, uh, on, once, uh, on one of those trips that we made to Memphis, and I'll never forget his answer. He said there were many times that he couldn't pay the wrestlers a whole dollar each. <laughs> He said that, that's how bad it was, right? And uh, the price of admission, though, but when you think about it, man, everything was extremely cheap, you know, and that's why, you know, nobody had any money. And so, you know, for, mm. for a nickel, you know, uh, you, you, could, uh, you could basically, uh, he, uh, they, that's what the price was for admission to his matches, you know. So bear in mind back in those days before tag matches, each card had only four men on it. And those four men had to fill two hours, basically, of entertainment. They had to, they had to have, have these long, grueling matches. And wow. that meant that you had two single matches on the card. Both of those single matches were going to be two out of three fall matches. And each match 
had to last at least an hour. This is before tag matches. I so, see. you know, it's way back in the day, man. <laughs> yeah. So it seems to me when wrestling was over that night, somebody ended up with a pocket full of nickels, maybe. So, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you, I mean, from, from, from the gate, a pocket full of nickels, and that's it. That's, a, that's incredible. You've got to be kidding me. They had to wrestle for at least an hour and sometimes got paid less than a dollar. <laughs> That's right, man. I mean, I had a hard time believing it too, man. But uh, when I thought about it, uh, and especially as I got older and uh, and I learned a little bit more about what the depression was all about, I I could really see it, you know. So, uh, and it, you know, there there was a lot of things that uh, you know you had to take into account. Uh, Roy said gas was two cents a gallon, and a loaf of bread was less than a nickel, you know. So it, it brings to mind, you know, a story that Roy told me exactly on this subject, man. And, uh, and I think, man, this, this story is going to kind of tell the tale of what you've just brought up here. And, uh, and uh, once we finish this, we'll move on from the 1930s and we'll go 50 years into the future to 1980. And we'll talk about another mass, mass wrestler here. Uh, and we'll finish this little story uh, Talk about a new new mass wrestler down there in that territory called the Georgia Jawjacker, man. So <laughs> Roy told me a story, man, about a trip in the 1930s. Uh, he said they were leaving from the western side of Tennessee, where all the wrestlers lived back in those days. It was the headquarters of wrestling in Tennessee. It was a little town called Dyersburg. Uh, Dyersburg was close to the Mississippi River. They were going to travel from Dyersburg, Tennessee, to Bluefield, West Virginia, more than 600 miles, one way on a, all of a two-lane road. And uh, because of an injury of the, one of the few wrestlers that he had, this was way back in the early part of the 1930s when there was basically only about four of them. You know, one of them got hurt, and they didn't have, uh, they didn't have that fourth man. So, uh, you know, uh, so... They, they got in the car and left for this trip to go to Bluefield, West Virginia, and uh, they knew they needed a fourth man. So uh, how would you figure they found him, Dave? They were going to have to <laughs> get him on the road while they were making the trip. So Wow. So, so it was, you know, because it was during the Depression, uh, a few people had jobs, and even fewer of them had cars. I mean, you know, so it was the day of hitchhikers. Man, and I, I don't know if you if you remember back. I remember as a kid, though, Dave, when when there were still guys hitchhiking on the roads everywhere. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Back in the Depression, Roy said <laughs> it was just body after body. They were, they, that's all. The way, and, and everybody was hitchhiking. Right. Nobody had the cars. <laughs> and so, you know, they had the only car, and they would come by. And he said, so there were hitchhikers on the road everywhere on this 600-mile trip. And the plan was that during this trip, somewhere along the road, they were all looking for for the the same type of person, man. And uh, they were looking for a big old burly guy that uh, could maybe wrestle. And uh, they were going to pick him up, and they were going to make a wrestler out of it. That is so. It's to me that that is so funny because uh, either you had a car or you walked. So it was if you were walking, you were auditioning, and you didn't know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And that's kind of what happens in this story. So Roy said they didn't find the right guy until they got about 50 miles out of Bluefield. You know, I mean, he said they just couldn't find the guy that looked right. And he said, you know, they all knew uh, as soon as they saw this guy, they all knew he was the one. And he said the second they saw him and he whipped the car over and they, Roy said he was a big old burly guy. And uh Guy got in the car, and uh, one of the first things he asked is, you know, well, well, what do you guys do for a living? I mean, you got a car, right, for one thing. I mean, you're not like all the rest of us out here. And uh, So uh, what do you guys do for a living? And they explained to him that uh, they were wrestlers, and, they, and then they talked to him, and they said, you know, actually, we're a man short, and how would you like to make some money tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Before they got to the building, uh, you know, they had him talked into it. And, uh, you know, so they figured out uh, basically how they could get him into a pair of wrestling tights. And one of them had an extra pair of wrestling tights that he could wear. And uh, 
And, you know, he pulled it out of his bag, gave it to him. But the hitchhiker, you know, he didn't have, they didn't have any wrestling boots, not an extra pair of wrestling boots. So the hitchhiker wore his old Brogan boots, man, you know, know, into the ring as a wrestler, you know. (laughs) Same stuff he had probably walked a thousand miles in or whatever. Yeah. (laughs) So then, uh, so Roy wrestled him, right? (laughs) Out of the other two, Roy was the toughest, obviously, and, so Roy wrestled a two out of three fall match with this guy. Wow. Roy said that he got 45 minutes out of this guy. Right? Wow. So, and he said the guy knew absolutely no wrestling, of course, you know. And uh, so Roy was basically shooting with him, you know. Roy just said, beat me. You know, we go out there, I want you to beat me. And the guy tried and tried and tried, and Roy just gave him what he wanted to. Just enough to keep him going. And enough to, you know, and he didn't take any chances that the guy might get a good hold on him and he might beat him. <laughs> so, you know, so Roy, occasionally, a couple of times, he said during the match, he had to stretch him a little bit, you know, to, to, to make, not enough to make him give up, but, you know, to, to make him stop what he was trying to do. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so basically he led him through a 45-minute match and a guy had never wrestled in his life. And uh, so he needed to get a long match out of the hitchhiker, and that's <laughs> and that's what he did, right? So by the end of the match, uh, he said, uh, which lasted only two falls, because <laughs> Roy beat him two straight falls. He didn't let him beat him, so he beat him two straight falls. He said, uh, he said after the two falls, he said uh, the hitchhiker was totally blown up. He said, he said he, he had mat burns on him from head to toe, you know, because he wasn't used to being in the ring and on a mat. And he said some of the mat burns were bleeding, and, you know, his knees were bleeding down into his boots. And, you know, and he, he said he was sitting there and he was obviously upset about what had happened to him here. Jeez, you know. And then he said, uh, you know, so Roy tried his best, you know, not to hurt him during the match. You know, he made him give up uh, to win both of the falls, but he he didn't really hurt him, right? So the hitchhiker, you know, had never asked about what he was going to get paid. That was never, you know, he didn't, and he probably, you know, didn't didn't have any money or very little, no doubt. So Roy paid the other two wrestlers when the matches were over, the other two guys, and they paid him 50 cents. That was the payoff. And uh, they were happy with it. You know, they were like, hey, well, you know, it's, it's, times are tough, you know. But so, uh, but when he paid the hitchhiker the 50 cents, he said the guy went crazy. <laughs> he said he, he yeah. started to scream. He said, are you guys nuts? He goes, you do this every night? He said, you throw each other around on that ring out there that yeah. feels like concrete and God. you try to break each other apart? You tear the hide off your body every time you touch that skin grind and cough that you got on that ring out there? And he goes, you wear yourselves completely out. Until you have to do what I did, crawl back here or to the hand on your my hands and knees to this dressing room. And he wow. goes, you know, <laughs> wow. And he said, and after all that, you only get fifty cents. <laughs> so, so he says, "Are you crazy? What kind of way is this to make a living?" <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, Roy said the other two wrestlers. They got really mad at the hitchhiker, right? And they both got up. They were going to tear into him, right? And Roy had to cut him off. He said, whoa, whoa, guys, wait a minute here. You know? so, huh. so then he says the hitchhiker then he demanded, you know, he says, uh, he says uh, to Roy, he says, you're going to pay me in at least a dollar. Right. Wow. Okay. For, for, the deal, right? for his match, right? So, so I remember asking Roy at that point when he's telling me this story, you know, I said, I said uh, well, what did you say to that? <laughs> he said, uh, he said, well, I couldn't believe. He said the only one that complained about the payoff was the hitchhiker. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, uh, he said, I told him no about the dollar, right? Right. And then he just kind of smiled at me and he said, uh, and I showed him the door. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. And I was thinking, I bet you did. <laughs> mm-hmm. well, don't let the screen hit you. Man, that's a great story and perfect for, for what we've been talking about so far. So how about before our break, which is coming up next, we ride south about 50 years later 
to Mobile, Alabama, and you set us up with the card for March 25th, 1980. Tell us about it. All right, man. Uh, I could do that, Dave. Uh, the opening match was another good one, man. Uh, Charlie Cook versus uh, fabulous Don Fargo, who is still still could do it, man. <laughs> he was in his day. Uh, Eddie Boulder uh, was taking on Randy Rose. Tony Charles wrestled Norvell Austin. And then there was a World's Ladies Championship match. Uh, the champion, Fabulous Mula, was defending against Princess Littleheart. And after what had happened the week before, in a rare six-man, there was going to be a rare six-man tag special challenge match this night. Joe LaDuke, Robert and I were facing Jimmy Golan, the Big C, and Dr. Bill Irwin. And the main event was the Mongolian Stomper, managed by Don Carson, mm. uh, defending his southeastern belt again against the Georgia Jawjacker. But this time, it was going to be in a lumberjack match with all the wrestlers surrounding the ring. Wow. Another great card. A world title match, southeastern title match, six-man tag, and a bunch more, including a lumberjack match. Stay with us, folks. We're going to be right back with the TV show that promoted this card in just a minute when this Studcast continues. Hey, folks, on the break on this Studcast, we don't talk nearly enough about Ron's fantastic lion story, Brutus. It's one of the best novels in history. It is constantly compared to Jaws, one of the best books and movies ever done. You can get Brutus on Ron's website at tnstud.com. Click Stud Store, $19.99 for the book only, or $29.99 personally autographed to you. It makes a great gift. Shipping is absolutely free. To find out what others think, read over 70 reviews with a 4.5 rating at Amazon Brutus Novel. It is truly one of the most unusual thrillers ever written. Get yours today at tnstud.com. Click Stud Store and own a piece of history. Okay, Studcast fans, welcome back in. Studcast number 343. 343 of these. This one is called Jawjacker versus Stomper lumberjack plus moolah which we're about to hear about that's going to be really cool all right and remember every one of these stud casts you can find at tnstud.com tnstud.com every stud cast starting with number one all the way up to this one number 343 all right last stud cast the mongolian stomper did sit-ups for the entire hour, he was going for a world record and fell, just barely fell short. All right, so what do you have for Southeastern wrestling fans 44 years ago, Saturday, March 22nd, 1980? Well, the upcoming card on the week uh, following uh, that TV 44 years ago was very different from what had been happening for many weeks uh, at a time there. We had had a lot of the same matches. Uh, this one is a totally different card, man. Uh, one match in particular was extremely new, and it featured someone I had a great relationship with, and I had basically known since I was a young boy, and someone that had wrestled for my father and my grandfather both. And uh, this match was a going to be that world championship match that featured a ladies champion who was making her first appearance for Southeastern Gulf Coast, first appearance for me down there in that area, after appearing several times for for me in Southeastern Knoxville up in that area. I used to put her on these uh, triple world championship cards sometimes that we had there. So this was basically her first trip for me. But I got a feeling, Dave, she'd been down there before, man, no doubt about it. So the TV show opened up with her. Uh, Charlie Platt ran down the TV matches and then turned it over to the ring announcer <laughs> to introduce probably the greatest trainer. She not only was the world champion, but she trained all the women, all the great women wrestlers of, of her time. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was not uh, just the trainer, but obviously the ladies' world champion, uh, the fabulous Moolah. And uh, she was going to be defending her belt the next four nights in a row against the lady wrestler that she had trained, Princess Littleheart. And Princess Littleheart was one of the many ladies that had endured, I'm going to call, I'm going to say that, that had endured her legendary and painful training. I mean, wow, she was something else, man. And she was also happy to defend her belt 
on this TV show for me, which she didn't do very often, you know. Uh, but uh, like I said, I'd known her since I was a kid. And uh, she had brought even another lady wrestler with her specifically for this TV match. And that one was a great lady wrestler, too. She was, her name was Joyce Grable. So, I mean, she had great talent, and she was a monster talent herself. And I was always amazed at how tough Moolah was, man. And even if she was in her, you know, at the, she was in her 40s by this time, and uh, she was still a bad son of a gun, man. And I'm not sure to this day how many times she had worked, and like I said a minute ago, the old Gulf Coast territory down there in the past. But I know for sure it didn't take long after the bell rang for this TV match for the studio crowd to be totally astounded by how vicious she was. I mean, she was ooh, nasty in the ring. And <laughs> so fans had the opportunity to see her on TV. Uh, you know, those that were sitting at home watching her on TV, if they'd never seen her before, uh, and she's going to be in four cities that week. I felt pretty assured, man, that there were going to be a lot of fans buying tickets just to see Moolah. Right? <laughs> she made an impression on me and everybody else. Hmm. Wow. I, I saw her maybe on this card. She scared the heck out of me way back then. I was a, a, a young guy, obviously. I wouldn't have wanted to meet her in a dark alley. If she was mad at me, that would be uh, not the place to be. I'd say, obviously, she won that TV match, it sounds like. Yeah, well, she certainly <laughs> did, my man. And, and I, bet, uh, I bet it had a lot of people at home buzzing, man, like that studio audience was. The yeah, studio yeah. crowd was buzzing during our whole deal. And I'm sure those at home are going, whoa, wow, this is, she's a nasty, she's a bad lady. So, so in the next TV segment, Tony Charles, uh, came to the set. He was carrying his United States Junior Heavyweight Championship belt. He sat down with Charlie. He was going to watch his next opponent uh, coming up uh, in the following week, Norvell Austin. So the ring, announcer, the ring announcer introduced Norvell and his opponent. But in a rare moment uh, before the bell rang, Austin just got out of the ring and went straight to the set to confront Tony Charles. You know, the, the wrestler's waiting on him in the ring. They've already been announced. So, And he got kind of right in Tony's face, and he accused him of He said, for the last four months, after I beat you four months ago for your U.S. title, you've not given me a match for four months. He goes, and, you know, and he said, I've been waiting for this. He goes, uh, you know, and that he said, uh, I deserve a championship match after waiting as long as I have, not just a regular match like it's booked. You know, so uh, in the ring, you know, the referee did what he should have done at this point. I mean, you know, the time for the match to go, you already been announced. You know, so he had him ring the bell on Norvell, and he began to count Norvell out. You know, so uh, Norvell had to leave the set and head toward the ring. You know, and uh, so Tony told him, you know, uh, basically as he's leaving the set, he says, you know, you got to earn your shot at the belt, you know. And uh, he said, you beat me next week and you'll get your title shot. So Norvell was already headed back to the ring at this point, And he yelled back at Tony. He says, uh, polish up my belt real good. So, so he shot up into the ring and he exploded, man, into his waiting opponent. And, uh, and he punished this poor guy. And he gave him all kinds of bumps. And uh, after each one of those bumps, he went over to the rope and he screamed something at Tony, one thing after another after <laughs> another. You know, I mean, yeah. he was, his attention was more on Tony than his opponent. Right. But when he got ready to finish this guy off, he screamed at Tony. He says, this is the way I'm going to beat you for my belt. And he took the guy and shot him into the ropes, and then he charged him, and he hit him with one of those diving headbutts, man. Wow. He caught that guy right in the face, and he sent his feet flying straight up in the air, and the back of his head slammed on the mat. I was like, wow. It was a definite calling card for Tony Charles. Taunting him from inside the ring. Okay. All right, so now let's go to the personality profile. Set us up on that one. Who was on that? Well, the crowd showed their delight, man, uh, with a big cheer, man, when they saw the who was on the profile. Uh, Joel Duke and Rob and I, we came out of the dress room and headed for the profile set with Charlie. And Rob and I had a story to tell, beginning back with the tag team championship match from two weeks earlier 
against Jimmy Golden and Big C. And we explained that in the match, the Big C continually kept trying to load and use his black glove until we got so upset that we just went to the dressing room and intentionally got ourselves counted out because we couldn't lose the belts on a count out, you know. So because of the way that match ended, Rob and I had a conversation the next day with Don Curtis, Southeastern Wrestling Commission. We told him uh, we didn't want to wrestle these two guys again. If, if he's just out there to load his glove and try to win a match, we don't want to wrestle him. A guy. And, you know, he, he, he agreed, you know, that, uh, you know, that we did the right thing. You should have left the ring. You got him. You got counted out, but uh, you didn't lose your belt. And he says, I'm going to allow you guys to pick your opponents for not only the, the next match, but for for several of your tag matches in the future. So uh, we chose Randy Rose and Norvell Austin. <clears throat> so that was the two opponents that, uh, we had we'd watched uh, with Joe LaDuke and uh, Charlie Platt in the video four days earlier, you know. So we watched this match. There's me, Joe LaDuke, and Rob watching the match we had with Randy Rose and Norvell Austin. And uh, so the video showed uh, me about to pin Randy Rose and about to win the match. And, uh, and here comes Jimmy Golden, who had wrestled Joe LaDuke in the previous match before this match that he got interfered in and he entered the ring and he stomped me off of Randy Rose and the referee instantly rang the bell. They disqual he disqualified Rose and Austin, but, uh, Golden wasn't there to help Rose and Austin. He wanted to make us mad enough to choose him for the next tag title match. Right? Because that's way the things were supposed to be going down. So he threw, as soon as he, he did that, uh, he stomped me off. Uh, he threw the referee over the top rope out into the floor, and then he went after Rob. And when I got up, I threw Austin and Rose. They were still in the ring. I tossed them over the top rope. The match was already over. So I got rid of them, and then Rob and I started working on Jimmy Golden. And along comes the Big C, who was Golden's partner versus with us the, the week before. Mm -hmm. And uh Big C wasn't even booked on the card. He came into the ring with his street clothes on and his black glove, right? <laughs> and he loaded his glove and he hit Rob with the glove and they busted Rob open and then Golden grabbed me and Big C tried to hit me. I ducked and he hit Golden. So I started putting the boots to the Big C and out of nowhere, here comes Dr. Bill Irwin. Got his lasso with him, his rope, man. And, uh, you know, Neither Rob or I had even been in the ring ever with this guy, right? So he put the rope around my throat, and he started trying to tie me up. And now you had Big C, you had Jimmy Golden, you had Dr. Bill Irwin, you had Norville Austin back in the ring and Rose back in the ring. There was five guys in there against me and Rob, and I've got a rope around my throat. And uh, thank goodness this is where Joe LaDuke got involved. He came down to the ring. And once Joe got in there, he sent them all running, man. So it was really a wild end to this tag match. Uh, Rob and I had basically found out quickly that picking our opponents wasn't going to be a good idea because all of these heels, they were going to go after us every match, uh, hoping that we were going to pick them to make, make us mad and they'll take me for the championship tag match. So Joe finally at this point had a chance to basically say something here. And he told Charlie that we had talked, the three of us, about this. And Rob and I had decided not to give anybody, any of these guys that were wrestling in the area, a chance at the tag belts. And, uh, and he said, and under the circumstances, he agreed that was a great idea. And that at this point, uh, that the three of us needed to stop this now or somebody was going to get hurt really bad. That the three of us wanted to set things straight with the three wrestlers involved in this. It was Golden and Dr. Bill Irwin and the Big C. We wanted to, we wanted to match with them. That uh, We wanted just to have the three of them against the three of us in the ring. No more tag championship match. So uh, he said, Jimmy Golden. You know, he said, Jimmy Golden had already wrestled me. He said, Dr. Bill Irwin had wrestled Tony Charles. And the Big C, he said, wasn't even on the card, Charlie. He goes, what business did he have in there? So he said, uh, 
he said, you know, I suggested we 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 challenge them to a six man tag and the three of us against the three of them. <laughs> Studio audience agreed, man, that that was a great idea. Got a big pop on the end of it. I bet they did. All right. So I was wondering earlier when you announced this card, what was behind the special six man tag? You, Robert, and Joe LaDuke against Jimmy Golden, the Big C, and Dr. Bill Irwin. So now I understand the reason for it. That should be a great match. So how about the next TV match? Well, it opened up with the Georgia Jawjacker. Uh, wa- watching his best two out of three falls Southeastern Championship match from four days earlier with the Mongolian Stomper. The video obviously was highly edited because it lasted 60 minutes and it went three falls. Uh, the first fall was won by the Jawjacker and the second fall was won by the Stomper. Now, the third fall the, was the contentious one in this match. Uh, the Stomper was obviously blowing up uh, at this point. Uh, and part of that, you know, might have been because he did that, uh, you know, the, he tried to break that world record with the sit-ups of the program before. So he had, I think that took something out of him. Uh, so, uh, you know, so Stomper was, uh, you know, obviously blowing up. Jawjacker was coming on strong. And uh, Don Carson was closely watching the clock, man, about the si- uh, for the 60-minute time limit to run out. And, uh, and it, because it was the third fall and it was getting close, he just kept dragging the stomper out of the ring and stalling with him out there. And uh, he could tell the stomper was running out of gas and he wanted to keep him from losing the match and uh, from Jaw Jagger winning the championship. So he just kept stalling and stalling until obviously bell rang, time limit expired. Uh, Jaw Jagger, uh, at that point, uh, you know, he was on his feet. He was ready to go. And Stomper was out there on his face, the video showed, laying on his face on the concrete. I mean, the, the Jawjacker uh, thanked uh, you know, Don <laughs> Curtis for giving him another championship match. And he, he loved the idea it was going to be a lumberjack match. He said uh, wrestlers are going to be around the ring to throw the contestants back in. He says, that kind of assures me that Carson tries to stall the match or the stomper, uh, you know, tries to leave the ring, uh, that uh, they're not going to be able to do either of those. So just like in the personality profile, uh, the six-man tag made sense, and uh, and this lumberjack match made sense as well under the circumstance. So the studio crowd got another pop from, from that concept. Wow. All right. So who was coming to the ring next? Well, it was the same wrestler, man, that the studio crowd's attention – uh, you know, uh, was was basically uh, toward every week. They, they were they paid attention to this guy, and the uh, problem was that they never knew when to expect uh, to have a problem. So uh, he, the Mongolian stomper man, I, he exploded from the dressing room, uh, and he didn't head toward the jawjacker who was leaving the set at that point. He ran for the bleachers, man, where the fans were. You know, and uh, once again, he created pandemonium in the studio. It was crazy, you know, and his manager, Don Carson, wasn't the engine. Uh, You know, uh, the Big C was his manager. The Big C went straight into the ring. He was carrying the southeastern belt. He was all smiles watching the Mongol do his thing out there. And then uh, Big C took the microphone away from the announcer, and he announced that Don Carson was sick. And he said, I'm going to be handling the stomper. So uh, they, that was uh, they were kind of doing their thing, the two of them. <laughs> Imagine that, the Big C having to take Carson's place. Hmm, wonder why. Yeah, you know, and <laughs> yeah, that'll, that'll be very evident in the next TV match. Mm-hmm. But there was only a few scattered fans left in the bleachers when this started, and the Stomper finally came back to the ring. And uh, before the bell even rang and the announcer did his thing, the uh, Mongol just uh, turned his focus on that poor wrestler standing across the ring from him. And as usual, he had no pity, man. He just ran over and he started pounding this guy on the back and the chest. And he was pounding him so hard you could hear the, bre- the breath exploding from the guy's body with every blow. It was like, wow, he, just, he was uh, crushing his inside. And then he shot him in the ropes and he put him, that huge black boot in his stomach and the 
poor guy ended up laying flat of his back. And while that was not a good position to end up with with the stomper man, so the stomper just ran to the ropes and and uh, boy, uh, he bounced off the ropes three times. Uh, he returned to this guy and he stomped him right in the face all three times. But before he mercifully covered him, uh, it was basically a classic Mongolian stomper win. <laughs> I think you described that very well, Stud. Pandemonium first, followed by complete devastation. All right, the last TV match. Set that up for us. Well, it was Jimmy Golden, the Big C, and Dr. Bill Irwin. Uh, they were the three opponents with that we had coming up in that upcoming six-man tag the following week. And uh, they did the... Uh, they didn't have it nearly as easy as the Stomper did, though. Uh, they they had two darn good wrestlers in there against them, Charlie Cook and Eddie Boulder. And uh, they held up their side of that match pretty well. But, but uh, by the end of it, uh, their young partner, uh, he was really no match from Jimmy Golden and Big C and, and Irwin's experience. All right, so now I know why Don Carson in the Stompers match was replaced by the Big C. I can't believe Carson thought he was... He was fooling anyone. Still, that was a pretty good TV uh, altogether. Five of the top heels in wrestling in three matches and the world ladies champion defending on television. So what happened in the arenas the following week? Well, Charlie Cook had a 15-minute time limit draw with the fabulous Don Fargo. Uh, that was a great way to open the night. Uh, I uh, both those guys were super, man. Uh, Randy Rose uh, sneaked by Eddie Boulder. Norville Austin made a statement, man. Uh, he wasn't just kidding about what he said on TV. Uh, he beat Tony Charles, and he earned his second shot at being the United States junior heavyweight champion the following week. He was going to get that title shot. Uh, in the ladies' world championship match, Princess Little Heart fared no better than Joyce Grable had on TV, man, with the iconic, uh, fabulous Moolah. I watched all four of these matches that they had, she had with uh, Princess Little Heart. Uh, Saturday night, uh, Sunday, we were in Pensacola, Monday in Montgomery, Tuesday in Mobile. I felt sorry, man, for Little Heart. Wow. <laughs> but, but I doubt any real fan of the sport left unimpressed with the champion, by golly. You know? <laughs> Fabulous Moody, Moolah was absolutely that, man, and, uh, and she was going to be back. Wow. So the special six-man tag was something special, man. Uh, actually, a, a couple of the six of us uh, ended up bleeding, bleeding in the match, and uh, the match had to be stopped. Both teams were disqualified. And in the Southeastern Championship Lumberjack match, we had 12 wrestlers surrounding the ring. Uh, six of those 12 had just finished the, being part of that wild encounter, this, uh, the six-man tag, you know. And there was still a lot of anger around that ring as well as up inside of it uh, at this point. And so every time either the Georgia Jawjack or Mongolian Stomford left the ring, there was some kind of brawl between the six of us out there because – we every, everybody went to it to throw the whoever was that got uh, sent out of the ring back into the ring, and that just gave us the opportunity to go after each other again. And uh, so it was kind of like pandemonium for most of this match. I mean, fans were loving it. Uh, it was pretty crazy. Uh, so there was as much fighting basically uh, on the floor as there was up in the ring, and that was saying a lot because there was a lot of action in the ring. At the end of the match, the Georgia Jawjacker finally had the stomper in his sleeper hole. And the referee was right there, ready to record the victory. And Jimmy Golden reached in to grab the referee's leg and drug him out of the ring. So all the lumberjacks, except for Big C, went to where the ref was and where Jimmy Golden was. Uh, you know, trying to get things, uh, especially the referee, back into the ring. And, uh, you know... All hell broke loose, basically, at that point. The Big C, during all this, he sneaked around up into the ring behind the jawjacker and hit him back of the head with his loaded club. Uh, Joe LaDuke entered the ring. He put the Big C in a bear hug. <laughs> Dr. Bill Irwin went in the ring after LaDuke. That was followed by me and Rob, followed by Jimmy Golden, then the referee. There was no stopping it at that point. <laughs> 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 It was like a battle royal, and the referee, he, he had no choice. He had to ring the bell to stop the match, and 
but it didn't, nobody paid any attention to the bell. I mean, it just went on and on. Uh, and the building was going crazy. The match was thrown out entirely. And instead of the lumberjacks keeping the contestants up in the ring like it was supposed to be, the lumberjacks end up in the ring themselves. Wow. Okay, I can't wait to hear what had to be coming back next week after all that. So how about the attendances for this card? How'd you do? Everything, man, was up again. Uh, Montgomery was back over 4,000 people. Dothan went from 4,100 to 4,300. Wow. Mobile went back to a sellout again of 5,600. We were in Expo Hall in the smaller building. The three major markets uh, packed 13,900 people, man, uh, in the, into uh, those three nights. And then the two regular Florida cities that we ran every week, Pensacola and Panama City, they added another 7,000 uh, to that 3,900, 13,900 figure. So, and then every week, uh, the sixth city every week was a spot show. Uh, and we handpicked those spot shows. It happened to be that this week the town was Monroeville, Alabama, and they had uh, 2,500 people in Monroeville, Alabama. So, so it was over 23,000 fans in one week without using, without being in Mobile's main arena. Where we could have put even more people in. Uh, so if you took that 23,000 fans and you multiplied it by the 52 weeks of the year, that would be 1,200,000 fans in a year. Uh, and there were very few territories in the world at that time were drawing that many people. That's a uh, pretty amazing figure. It really is an amazing number of people, especially considering the largest city, Mobile. Uh, the population was just under 200,000 back then. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we were competing with cities like, uh, you know, Tampa and Miami and Florida and uh, right. Atlanta and Georgia, New Orleans and Louisiana. I mean, uh, Dallas and Texas. I mean, it was, uh, you know, major cities and, you know, our largest population was only 200,000. It's hard to believe uh, that uh, what we had, uh, we were only seven months away, basically at this time too, Dave, of uh, adding Birmingham. The biggest city is that that I ever got to run, man, uh, to this 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 little territory that we're operating. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how you did in Birmingham, considering that it was, uh, as you mentioned, the, is the largest city in the state of Alabama. Hard to imagine what you could have done with cities like Atlanta, Tampa, or New Orleans. All right, I'm sorry, but we're not going to have time enough time for a learning tree question on this studcast. So set us up about next week. Where are we going to be riding next week when the stud cast continues? Well, I think our hidden history lesson is going to be the last of my grandfather Roy's territory. Uh, this one is going to be the one I'm going to do next week. Uh, I think maybe the best. Uh, my grandfather was going to do something few, if any, wrestler had ever done. I don't think any of them ever did anything like what he is about to do in this next uh this next podcast that we're going to be talking about. He was going to save a bear from certain death. Uh, he's going to train the bear that he saved to wrestle. He's going to take that bear on a two year tour from Mexico into Canada and all over much of North America. He's going to draw some of the largest crowds in the history of wrestling. And uh, then this week's uh, crazy six man tag is going to get even better, ne bigger next week. Uh, Next dead cast, the Georgia Jawjacker and the Mongolian Stomper are going to be added to this six man. And uh, we're going to end up with an eight man tag. Uh, wow, that's going to be well, to pretty much like this match ended this week with uh, no telling what happened. And then, and uh, it's going to also have a United States junior heavyweight title match and much more. Wow, you know, I keep saying, but how can I not? Your stud cast keep getting better week after week. Next week, you're going to be talking about a wrestling bear that tours North America and an eight-man tag match that is bound to be a wrestling war. Where can you hear a better wrestling podcast than that? 
I'm telling you folks, I can't wait. All right, you know the deal. On Facebook, you can find Ron at Ron Fuller, the Tennessee stud. Like and follow him there and automatically become friends with a legend. The same thing on Twitter, now known as X. Ron Fuller Welch, you can follow him there. Check out the fantastic website, tnstud.com. This studcast is going to be there with every, every studcast ever done. As we mentioned earlier, starting with number one, running all the way up to this one, number 343. You can listen to Studcast day after day after day and still not finish. You got to check them out. Listen, shop the Stud store too, where you can get 43 Super Studcast, four different 8x10 photos, the thrilling lion novel Brutus, personally autographed to you, and t shirts still on sale, only $15.99. Let me ask you, Stud, and I know there are a ton. I helped you with a couple of these on the Super Studcast. That's you spending time with some major superstars over the years. And listen, there are a ton of them. Can you mention some of the folks that that you talk? I know you do one super stud cast, which is really detailed about Andre the Giant. I think that was might have been the very first one. Name some of the other folks that you talked to over time on the super stud cast. Oh, geez, man. I mean, uh, I talked to Bob Armstrong, uh, who is no longer with us. By it's a shame. Uh, Ron Wright, I do Ron Wright. Uh, I do my brother. I do Jimmy Golden. Uh, the late do, Terry. Uh, Kevin Ter- Sullivan. Yeah. Uh, wow. Uh, the Austin Idol. I mean, uh, it's just, uh, it's a litany. But it's a tremendous, those things are really, really fantastic. They're all two hours plus. And uh, I do Terry Funk and yep. Stan Hansen. Yeah. Uh, it's just a who's who of wrestlers, man. And you hear you hear Terry Funk, you hear Stan Stan Hansen in their voice, in their words, talking about some of these historical stories, and I think it's truly amazing. Again, check it out at tnstud.com. Forty three of those super studcasts. One of those was with Jacques Rougeau. I helped you out with that one. He tells an amazing story about behind the scenes in WWE and how he ended up being he he was bullied by one of the british bulldogs and he stopped that with yeah. a, with a punch or two in the hallway and everybody went whoa <laughs> but hearing jock tell that story was was really fun and that that's one of the ones that I was a part of that I really remember hey you can also subscribe now at youtube southeastern rewind get the best in old school wrestling You'll find 413 videos, the last 120 stud casts, 52 stud stories, 112 short rides with the stud, and now 15 Ask the Stud question and answer shows. All of this exclusively on Southeastern Rewind. It is the best deal in old school wrestling. All right, stud, any final comments on this one? Yeah, I, I want to thank everybody for their continued support, and uh, and I want to, you know, I want to say how good it feels, man, to be back doing these studcasts, you know. And uh, I hate I missed one last week, but I hope everybody understands that, you know, every once in a while, uh, uh, I, I'm going to be, uh, I may find a, find that I can't get to doing one, but uh, I hope you enjoyed this one, everybody that's listened to it. I hope you join us again next week. For, for the next one, uh, you know, it's kind of a special one, especially with the uh, rest and bear stuff. And, uh, <laughs> and please take care of yourselves and others, and may God bless us all. For Ron Fuller in the Great Smoky Mountains, I'm David Summers saying thank you for listening. Find me at David Summers Productions at gmail.com. This studcast is a David Summers production for Tennessee Stud, LLC. Thanks for joining us today for this historic Studcast. The true story continues next week. So full Nelson, your friends, and point them in our direction for another ride with the Tennessee Stud. One, two, three. This is David Summers saying so long from the Great Smoky Mountains.